Your speeches do not have to be chronological. You are a speech terminator. And you can jump around the timeline however you wish. So many great stories get bogged down in the timeline. Being a great storyteller is knowing what are the key details to focus on. In this video, we're going to help you focus on those key details and get your timeline right, just like a speech terminator. If you've watched my work for a while and you know my story of how I became a speaker, you'll know that my story is essentially, I lost my dad to cancer, tried to find my way in life, went to Experts Academy. At Experts Academy, realized that it was my purpose to become a speaker, wrote my first book, The Last 60 Minutes, got my first speaking gigs off the back of that, and everything was happily ever after from that point on. That storyline is true, but it's so much more messy than the version that you've heard. What I've done with that story in order to capture the essence of it is streamlined the details that I've focused on so that it brings it into a story that I can tell in as little as five minutes and in a more extended version I can go into the 10, the 15, maybe even a 20 minute version of that story adding in a few extra key details. What you'll realize with your personal journey and personal life story is that life is messy and although life creates great stories it doesn't always give you the stories on a silver platter and when you try to tell your stories just like they happened in life they're messy life gives you the first draft of a story and you have to work on that just like an author would work on their manuscript just like a screenwriter would work on their script, in order to streamline those details, get everything moving in the same direction, so that the story has the power and essence without any of the bogged down details that detract from that. Let's look at three ways that you can streamline your timeline so that you can tell great stories. The first thing you have to do is to avoid using lazy phrases to time travel. You'll hear these phrases all the time in amateur stories. Once upon a time, fast forward to. What happens with these phrases is they're just ways of trying to connect parts of the story that you haven't worked on hard enough. Take once upon a time, for example. It's almost never necessary. If you're telling a completed story, we know it's already happened, so it must have been in the past. You want to use different phrases to indicate the time period. If you say, for example, when I was at high school, that gives us a timestamp. We know that that's 10, 20 or 30 years in the past, depending on roughly how old you are and how well we can guess how old you are. So you don't need to say once upon a time in high school because in high school already captures that time period. Similarly, with fast forward, it's like saying, oh, I don't know uh, how to tell you about how I went from being 22 to 35. So I'm just gonna say fast forward. There's different ways to indicate that time period. If at 22, you started as an intern in the company, you can say, by the time that I got to regional manager, that gives us a rough estimate of time. We know, okay, they didn't go from intern to regional manager in two years. It was probably more like 10 years. And that gives us a fairly good guesstimate of where you are. So don't use these lazy time travel phrases because they take the audience out of the story. They're a bit jarring when we hear them. You want to have a smooth transition using language that makes it really clear where we are in the moment of time of the story. Secondly, you want to tell your story in the present tense. The mistake a lot of amateur storytellers make is they tell the story in the past tense. And you might think, well, shouldn't you do that, David? Because the story happened in the past. The thing about the past tense 
is it reveals that it's a completed story. And at key moments in the story, this can take away some of the drama and tension and suspense. Imagine I'm telling a story of, I looked down at my leg and I saw blood was pouring everywhere. By telling it in the past tense, we go, okay, David doesn't have blood pouring out of his leg now. We know that he managed to resolve that challenge. Something happened, something came along to help. And the tension at that moment of, oh my God, what's going to happen to David's leg? is a little bit removed. We're too detached from that situation. But imagine I tell it in present tense. I look down at my leg. Blood pours everywhere. Do you see how we get into that moment a lot more? You can see the leg, you can see the blood pouring. And what's the question in your mind? What's going to happen next? What's going to happen to David's leg? You only get that when you tell the story in the present tense rather than the past tense. That present tense allows you to add the drama and suspense as if the audience are in the story and not listening to the story. Our Facebook group, Rise and Inspire Speakers, provides you with a safe, supportive community to develop the skills to get your message out into the world. We host a virtual summit, Inspire Week, within the group every month where you can sign up for a 30-minute slot to speak live in the group. This is a free opportunity you can sign up for month after month to practice your skills, try new things, and refine aspects of your story and message. There is a ton of educational content that gets pumped into this group. You can access ongoing educational resources that help you gain more confidence on camera, create more compelling speech content, and develop a deeper connection with your ideal audiences. Speaking of connection, the members of our community are fantastic. They are like-minded people who, just like you, want to make a difference in the world and will cheer you on and encourage you every step of the way. If you want to master your virtual speaking skills, then this is the place to be. The third thing you have to do is make sure that the facts don't get in a way of good story. Let me be clear. I am not advocating lying and making things up. There are a lot of grifters out there who tell these sob stories of how they were broke, how this happened, how they had this failure, and all of it is just made up to try and manipulate people. That is not what we're doing with our stories. What we are doing with our stories is we're trying to capture the truth of the story, which isn't necessarily the exact blow by blow chronological core count of the facts. Let me give you an example to illustrate this. I'm sure many of you may have heard my story of the last 60 minutes, the last 60 minutes that I spent with my dad on the day that he died, the last 60 minutes of his entire life. And if you've heard the version of the story, I walk into the room, I see that dad is at the end. We have this final conversation. I tell him these three truths. I'm grateful for the job you did of raising me. I'm incredibly proud to be your son. I love you. And those were the last three things that I said to him. He lost consciousness. And he died right there in front of me. And when I looked at dad lying there on his deathbed, I realized one day that was going to be me. And I decided that I wanted to make sure that I was happy with my life when I got to that point. I walked out of the room and started a new chapter of my life. Everything in that story happened. All of that is true. But there's some inconvenient facts that get in the way of that story and bog it down. Let me tell you the true factual account of how this story happens. I get on a three hour train journey to go and see dad. I don't know that it's his final day. 
I don't know that I'm going to have these final 60 minutes with him. When I get off the train, I go to my girlfriend's house and we get a card and we write him a card. We don't go straight to the hospice. We, we waste time faffing around with this card and flowers. And then we don't get, well, none of us, had, we didn't have a car at the time, but we didn't get someone to drive us or we didn't get a taxi to the hospice. We walked to the hospice. <laughs> it took us much longer. Can you imagine if dad had died before I got there? Man, it just, it, <laughs> I, I shudder to think about it at times. And then when I get into the hospice, I don't go straight into dad's room. When I get into the waiting area, there's actually a couple of my cousins there and they've been visiting dad. After all, he's their, he's their uncle or their great uncle for, for some of them. And so I, I chat with them for a bit and then I go into the room and then I have that experience, which I told you about going into the room, seeing dad there and everyone else leaves the room and I do get to have that final conversation with dad. So all of that is as it is in the story. But then this isn't this magical moment with last rites complete and then that's the moment that that dad goes to sleep and dies. I actually, after that, dad, <laughs> dad starts trying to tell me that the pin numbers and his card numbers for, for his bank account, I, I don't say at the time, but I'm thinking, dad, when you die, I can't go using your account when you're dead. <laughs> People, people will think that I'm a fraudster. So he tells me, he tells me these, these details and I write them down. And in the end, what I did is I went into the bank and I was able to take dad's death certificate and prove that I was his son and, and all of that thing. So I was able to sort out, which is what he wanted. He wanted to make sure that everything that he had was left to me, but <laughs> we did it a different way to what he was trying to do. So we have this little like back and forth logistical thing. And then I actually go out of the room because, again, I don't know that dad's about to die. I don't know that we're in this this magical, poetic last 60 minutes of his life. I just think that we've had a conversation and we've said everything that we need to say. So I actually go out into for anyone who's been in a hospital or a hospice, which is end of life stuff. There's often a family room right next to the room. So I go out into this family room and uh, my auntie, dad's, dad's sister is there, a couple of the cousins are there, my half sister is there. And my auntie actually like, has some photographs and uh, my cousin makes us all a cup of tea and we're sitting there having tea and we're looking at these photographs. Another one of my cousins goes back into the room to, to sit with dad. And we're there looking at these photos and talking for maybe about 15 minutes before my cousin comes back in and says, dad's breathing is slowing down. And it's only then that we go back into the room. And then we have that moment of dad's lost consciousness. I'm there listening to his last breaths. I hear his last breath. The nurse comes in and confirms that dad has died. And even after he dies, I don't have this magical moment of, of looking at him and going, wow, dad's died, I need to sort my own life out. At first, I'm just, I'm numb, I'm in shock, and me and the, the rest of the family are talking, and, and we're there. Again, we're talking for maybe about 15, 20 minutes, and then everyone starts to leave gradually. Then it's just me and my girlfriend, wife now. And then we walk out, and that's the moment that I stop at the door. I look back. And that's when I have the realization. One day that's going to be me on my deathbed. And then I walk out and I don't in that moment decide, okay, bye dad, I'm starting a new chapter of my life. This is, this is retrospective where after the initial grief and shock starts to come in, I then have this feeling of this urgency of, I need to do something with my life. I need to do something different. I'm not living life the way that I want to. So when I tell you the streamlined version of that story, I'm telling the truth. All of that stuff actually happens. And I'm capturing the truth of the story, which is this deathbed experience with my dad. The last conversation I had with him in the last 60 minutes of his life made me want to change my life. 
but there's a lot of inconvenient facts that really slow down that story. I'm looking at the, the timer on the camera just now. It's taken me a long time to tell you the story, how it chronologically, factually happened on the date. And it really bogs down some of that emotion and, and potency in that, doesn't it? There's these little asides and, and the, there's, there's this, there's going and getting the card and then there's talking with my cousins and then there's my auntie showing the photographs. All of that, it takes away the pace of the story. And so when I tell the story to make a point and to deliver a message, you have to take those facts out of the story in order to capture the truth of the story. So as I said, we're not making things up. I didn't make up anything that happened or everything that I tell is true, how it happened, but I do streamline the story in order to capture the, the key essence of what I'm trying to communicate through that story. And that's what you need to do with your stories as well. Don't get trapped into telling the story exactly how it happened because life is messy. Life isn't designed like a book or a movie or a speech. You've got to work out what are the key parts that I need to keep in? What are the non-essential details that I need to take out? And when I take out those non-essential details, how do I streamline everything together so it fits as a story? Don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. Those are some tips on how you can streamline your timeline. Getting rid of those awkward, meaningless time travel phrases. Telling the story in the present tense. Finding the truth of the story, not the facts of the story. Don't lie, don't make things up, but find the essence of what you're trying to say. And when you're able to capture that essence, that's what makes you a great storyteller. And if you want more storytelling help going into the future, come with me if you want to speak. <laughs>